With apparent impenetrable bunkers being such a crucial part of modern warfare, it's no wonder that bombs built to destroy these safe houses are on the rise. Being able to destroy such a well-guarded area is like hitting the mother load for an aggressor. There's the potential to take out intelligence depots, weapon storage facilities, and key individuals on the enemy's side. But attacking these bunkers is no easy task. You need a particular type of weapon to penetrate layers of protection and then have something left to take out the target itself. Let's take a look at how this works. Bunker bombs are much more than just throwing a bigger explosive in the direction of the target. Bunker busters are special purpose bombs where the sole purpose is to punch through ground, concrete, or whatever is blocking a target. This kind of bomb has been around since World War II, when British Air Force aviators developed 22,000-pound blockbuster or earthquake bombs to penetrate Nazi bunkers. In 1944, the German battleship Tirpitz, the sister ship to the Bismarck, was hit by this kind of bomb and sank. Technology has advanced a long way since the Tirpitz was sunk. Modern bunker busters work a lot like a full metal jacket bullet. The copper jacket covering the lead bullet lets the slug go more easily through whatever it's fired at. Bunker bombs use the same concept, but instead of a copper jacket, it's a hardened steel case. And instead of a bullet, the bomb contains powerful explosives. More recent designs for bunker buster missiles began around the bombing campaign against Yugoslavia. They also came to light after it was discovered that Iraqi underground dugouts were so deep in the ground that there wasn't an existing bomb that could reach them. This was until the U.S. Air Force implemented a new bomb in the NATO-led bombing campaign against Serbia in 1999 and during the early parts of the Afghanistan and Iraq missions in the early 2000s. At the height of the first Gulf War, U.S. fighter jets struck an underground shelter for civilians in Iraq's Amrira city, killing 400 people. A decade later, in the Second Iraq War, the U.S. again invaded Iraq, and its bomber jets heavily pounded Baghdad with bunker busters. The U.S. said they were using the weapon to hit underground command centers of the Iraqi army and bring the war to a quick end. Israel has also used bunker bombs to get to heavily fortified Palestinian command centers. One particular significant drop of this type of weapon happened in 2014. The newer version of the American Bunker Buster has a 16-foot casing and an artillery barrel 14.5 inches in diameter and covered with solid steel. Inside, you'll find over 600 pounds of tritonal explosive, which is made up of 80% TNT and 20% aluminum powder. The nose of the bomb provides accuracy with a laser guidance system. This shines a light upon the designated target so the bomb knows precisely what it's aiming for. So that it stays accurate, there are tall retractable fins at the end of the bomb to help keep it stable. This new design was named the GBU-28, and it weighed approximately 4,400 pounds at a massive 19 feet tall. The bomb is dropped from a plane so that the bomb picks up a huge amount of speed and kinetic energy, which allows it to penetrate thick defenses. The principle therefore uses basic physics to use gravity as the most effective means of propulsion. So when the bomb hits the Earth, it's like a massive shot from a nail gun. In tests, the GBU-28 has penetrated a huge 100 feet of earth or 20 feet of concrete. Before a mission, intelligence sources or aerial satellite images reveal where the bunker is. The GBU-28 or equivalent is loaded into a B-2 stealth bomber, an F-111 or similar fighter plane. The bomb itself works because of two simple reasons. The hardened steel shell that is able to withstand the drop and the timer fuse that delays the blast to take out the target. The rigid tube that the bomb is contained in is extremely heavy and narrow. 
This gives the bomb the ability to puncture the toughest of surfaces. The highly hardened steel helps the bombs withstand and pierce through the Earth's surface without blowing its complete load. The other thing that avoids this is the delay before the bomb goes off. This is usually done by using a delay fuse or a hard target smart fuse so that the bomb blows up at just the right time to create the most damage. It's clear that bunker bombs offer a massive advantage during warfare as they can penetrate targets that no other bombs can get to, even if bunkers are deep underground. But they're not without their disadvantages. Despite being very accurate for such a big bomb, there is still a big risk of civilian casualties and the weapon has a history of this. Also, from a military perspective, the bomb's massive weight means that only one can be used at a time unless bigger aircraft are used. Smaller military-grade aircraft such as the F-15 Eagle can only drop one during a flight. To combat this, a smaller twin bomb known as the Blue 109 Bunker Buster Bomb is used for the same purpose. But at half the weight of its big GBU-28 brother, it's far less destructive. Another issue with the GBU-28 is that its laser guidance system doesn't navigate well in bad weather conditions, but this has been addressed and improvements with more recent bunker busters. A new version of the bunker buster bomb, known as the GBU-72, is expected to be more powerful than its predecessors. A few tests of the new design were carried out in 2021, and new trials continued throughout 2022. Some primary differences between the older and newer designs revolve around their weight and internal navigation system. With the new GPS-assisted internal navigation system, the GBU-72 will have the ability to work under any weather conditions and solve a major issue with its predecessor. The issue with weight has also been solved. With a 600-pound weight difference, the GBU-72 can also be carried by different bombers like a conventional strategic bomber or a stealth bomber. Bunkers are only continuing to be a feature when it comes to modern warfare and protecting assets. Nations like Iran and North Korea insist on using these to protect their most prized assets. This means now more than ever, bunker bombs are crucial to combat these threats. Hamas has been the latest group to employ the tactic of burrowing deep into the ground to hoard weapons and other assets. This has reignited the debate of using bunker bombs to neutralize this stockpile and potentially protect civilian lives. But as we've seen over the years, it's not quite as simple as this, and bunker bombs come with significant consequences. What do you think about bunker bombs? Let us know in the comments and please like this video if you've enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. The Taurus cruise missile is one of the most lethal weapons if you want to penetrate a bunker that was previously thought impenetrable. It's also capable of hitting a wide range of other targets. Its design lends itself to digging into underground fortresses and taking them out in a simple yet subtly sophisticated way. In this video, we're going to look at how the weapon does this and how it's being used around the world. The Taurus Kinetic Energy Penetration Destroyer, or KEPD-350, is a long-range air-to-surface missile developed and manufactured by the German-based company Taurus Systems. This company is made up of a joint venture between LFK Lenkflug Corpor System and Saab Bofors Dynamics. This makes the project a German and Swedish collaboration. The German Federal Office for Defense Technology and Procurement asked Taurus Systems to develop a high-precision, standoff-guided missile system in 1998. Three years later, successful tests on the image-assisted navigation system of Taurus KEPD-350 were carried out in the summer of 2001. Taurus Systems then performed free-flight tests on the missile system at the Denel Overberg Test Range in South Africa in the winter of the following year. 
The test was led by Wehrtechnische Dienststelle 61 and the German Air Force. Following the success of these tests, production of Taurus KEPD-350 missiles began in 2004. This air-to-ground guided missile system has an overall weight of 1.4 tons. It's 16.7 feet long with a wingspan of 6.7 feet and a diameter of 3.5 feet. It falls under the Missile Technology Control Regime's Category 2 weaponry. The Taurus has modular sections which can be adjusted based on the individual missions. The electronic systems of the missile are also modular. This modular design and added reliability reduce the life cycle cost of the system. Aerospace company APCON has supplied the missile seeker electronics. The Taurus missile is operational for day and night and all-weather deployment. It has low observability and terrain masking features that make it less detectable and more likely to survive. The missile carries around 481 kilograms of inert, multi-effect penetrator, high-sophisticated and target-optimized dual-stage warhead system for world-leading target penetration. The ignition system of the warhead is based on a programmable intelligent multi-purpose fuse. The programmable fuse has been fitted with layer counting and void sensing technology. The blast and fragmentation failsafe control the collateral damage to civilians near the target. The standoff and precision capabilities of the missile and its deployment range of more than 350 kilometers give maximum safety to the aircraft and crew that launched the missile. The way in which the Taurus is launched is that mission planners program the missile with the target, air defense locations, and planned ground path. After that, the missile uses a low-terrain-hugging flight path guided by an inertial navigation system, image-based navigation, terrain reference navigation, and GPS to the proximity of the target. Even without GPS, the missile is still capable of navigating over very long distances. The missile then starts a bunt or climb maneuver to an altitude deemed to achieve the best probability of finding the target and penetrating it. During the cruise flight, a high-resolution infrared homing camera can support navigation. The missile attempts to match a camera image with the planned 3D target model and, if it can't, it uses the other navigation systems or, if there is a high risk of unintended damage, it will change course to a pre-designated crash point instead of risking innocent lives. Taurus KEPD-350 is powered by a Williams P8315 turbofan engine. This gives the missile a cruise speed of about Mach 0.6 to 0.95 at very low altitudes. The missile has a range of up to 270 nautical miles, which is about 15% more than ones propelled with JP-10 fuel. With its dual-stage warhead system, the first part has been built to smash through hard or deeply buried targets, then the second produces fragmentation damage at a specific level of a building or bunker. This is due to what Taurus says is the world's only multi-programmable fuse. The missile has been very popular around the world. Spain received about 43 Taurus missiles through the Contractor Center. This order for the Spanish Air Force was placed in late 2004 and deliveries were completed by August of 2010. The missile was then integrated with EF-18 multi-role combat aircraft. The Taurus KEPD-350 has also been proposed as the suitable air-launched high-precision standoff cruise missile for the Indian Air Force's Sukhoi Su-30 Mark I fighter aircraft. Other possible countries that have expressed an interest in the missile include Australia, Canada, and Sweden. In 2016, South Korea's Air Force deployed air-to-ground Taurus-class missiles for the first time for combat use. These were purchased to target and destroy North Korea's nuclear and missile facilities at a long distance. The Taurus missile is mounted on F-15K fighter planes and can hit key facilities in Pyongyang from the sky over Daejeon, 164 kilometers south of Seoul. This is due to the huge range that the missile has, which we mentioned earlier in the video. Now, the missiles have been sent to Ukraine to help with the conflict there. As they are renowned for their stealth and accuracy, the 350 are seen as a valuable addition to Ukraine's military arsenal. As they are capable of flying at low altitudes and evading radar detection, these missiles are particularly suited to the challenging warfare landscape in Ukraine. This offers the potential for surprise attacks against well-defended Russian targets. They could also conduct long-range precision strikes deep into enemy territory, disrupting key installations and command centers. The Taurus KEPD-350 missile represents a significant operational advantage for the Ukrainian armed forces. Its operational range, in excess of 500 kilometers, is a key feature that allows Ukrainian forces to hit targets from a safe distance, 
well beyond the reach of most enemy air defenses. This capability is crucial in modern warfare, where minimizing risk to aircraft and crew is a huge requirement. The missile's navigation system we mentioned earlier is another aspect that sets it apart. The inertial navigation system, alongside image-based and terrain reference sensors, will be crucial. This multifaceted approach ensures highly accurate targeting even with jammed GPS signals. In a conflict like Ukraine's, where electronic warfare and signal jamming are widespread, a GPS-independent system is invaluable. Add to this the fact that it has been designed for hard and deeply buried targets with blast fragmentation effects for area targets, which makes it highly versatile. This is particularly relevant for striking a range of targets, from fortified bunkers to larger area targets. The missile's unique layer counting fuse technology allows for detonation at pre-selected levels within a target structure. This improves effectiveness against multi-layered defense systems as the Russians are expected to have. What do you think about the Taurus cruise missile? Let us know in the comments, and please like this video if you've enjoyed it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then subscribe to Spotlight for more. Thanks for watching. You don't name a weapon the mother of all bombs unless it's got some significant power. That's exactly what this bomb, also known as Moab, has. It's the largest non-nuclear weapon known to man and has been used in previous conflicts to take out terrorist targets. Let's take a closer look at what makes it so powerful. This weapon was designated the name GBU-43B and was designed as the largest ever satellite-guided air-delivered weapon in history. It was built to replace the unguided 15,000-pound Blue 82 daisy cutter used in Vietnam and early on in the Afghanistan conflict. It was developed in just nine weeks in 2003 to be available for Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Defense Secretary at the time, Donald Rumsfeld, said it was made to put pressure on Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein to stop fighting against the coalition. However, the bomb was not needed during that short-lived war. The mother of all bombs, as you'd expect, is a massive weapon. It spans 30 feet and weighs a giant 21,600 pounds. The weapon is GPS-guided and typically dropped from the cargo doors of an MC-130 transport plane set to detonate just before it hits the ground. It has a proximity fuse on the nose of its warhead that ignites when it reaches a certain altitude between 50 and 1,000 feet. When it blows up, it blasts fuel into the air. That fuel atomizes. Then there's a secondary explosion that lights the fuel that's already been atomized. The bomb falls from the aircraft on a pallet. A parachute tugs this pallet aside, which allows the weapon to glide down while being stabilized and directed by four grid-like fins. When it explodes, it creates a massive blast wave, which is thought to stretch for a mile in every direction, helped by 18,000 pounds of H6, a mixture of cyclotrimethylene and trinitramine, TNT, and aluminum. What also helps this spread is the bomb's thin aluminum casing, developed specifically to maximize the blast radius. The mother of all bombs is known as an air blast bomb. This means it doesn't throw out a lot of fragmentation like you'd expect from a normal bomb. It instead uses all-blast overpressure, which can blow down trees and other hefty pieces of debris, using these things as the fragmentation. So this type of bomb wouldn't work well on things like tanks, but it's very effective against people, especially those that are hiding. The huge amounts of overpressure would kill the people in the tanks or, more specifically, caves. The overpressure has been said to have the ability to turn people inside out. 
This pressure is a huge advantage as opposed to other precision-guided weapons like a Tomahawk or JDAM. The highly explosive content from within creates enough pressure to detonate many improvised explosive devices. It's this kind of weapon that causes the most damage to troops in the Middle East. At the time it was detonated in Afghanistan in 2017, it was thought to be an excellent way to neutralize ISIS, but also their planted explosives in the region. There aren't many bombs bigger than this, but they do exist. The GBU-57AB Massive Ordnance Penetrator, or MOP, aka a bunker buster. Like the MOAB, the MOP is guided by GPS, but it is much bigger at 30,000 pounds in weight. This makes it capable of penetrating deep into the ground to take out fortified bunkers or other installations. The mother of all bombs needs to be used sparingly, however, as each one costs around $16 million. As of 2017, the U.S. military had 20 Moab bombs and had spent about $314 million producing them. For that money, you get a very powerful weapon. During testing in the early 2000s, it created a mushroom cloud that could be seen from 20 miles away, according to the Air Force story. This bomb is one of the biggest non-nuclear threats to any group looking to evade anti-terrorist troops. Its massive size and specific engineering means it covers a large area with an enormous amount of pressure to take out threats, both human and mechanical. Although the Moab has rarely been used, it can always be seen as a threat to any enemy of the U.S. military. What do you think about the mother of all bombs? Let us know in the comments and please like this video if you've enjoyed it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then subscribe to Spotlight for more. Thanks for watching. Cluster bombs are controversial weapons for a reason. They're capable of doing a lot of damage over a very large area. They are bombs within bombs that can be deployed to wreak havoc from the skies and hit a massive target, peppering it with ammunition capable of wiping out expanses. But what are cluster bombs and how do they work? This helps to explain why they are so problematic when it comes to warfare. Cluster munitions, commonly known as cluster bombs, are weapons that have a carrier container filled with separate bomblets. A cluster bomb can contain anywhere from nine to several hundred bomblets. When released, the bomb is designed to open mid-air and distribute the smaller submunitions so that they will explode on impact and affect an area that can be as wide as several football fields. The main issue with the weapons is that they often fail to explode. They're also not that accurate as they're the equivalent of throwing mud at a wall and hoping some of it will stick. The smaller bomblets inside the primary device often malfunction and fail to explode on impact. That means they lie on or under the ground like a landmine, but more powerful. These devices can get triggered years or decades later, often by children. The percentage of unexploded submunitions from each canister varies, but can be as high as 30%. 98% of casualties caused by cluster bombs are civilians, which is why many groups oppose using them. Typically, the way that they work is that a cluster munition like one containing 202 BLU 97 AB submunitions is dropped from a plane. They can also be dispersed or released from rockets, artillery projectiles, and mortar rounds. The bomb is then able to fly on its own for about 9 miles before the submunitions are then released. A short time before they are, the container begins to spin. This spinning motion helps disperse the smaller bombs inside. The main bomb then opens at an altitude of between 330 and 3,300 feet. The main factors of release, such as the height, velocity, and rotation speed, all affect how large an area will be impacted by the submunitions when they strike. 
Each submunition is only around the size of a soda can, but has a lethal explosive contained within. They each deploy a small parachute that settles the descent to the ground and makes sure that they descend with their nose down to encourage an explosion. Each of these smaller bombs can be made of a copper cone that can pierce through 7 inches of armor. It also potentially contains more than 300 pieces of preformed steel fragmentation pieces designed to kill human targets. This is in addition to an incendiary material such as zirconium to burn its victims. The wind conditions can affect the distribution of the weapon significantly, as well as the altitude, but depending on these conditions, each bomb container can cover an area of over 860,000 square feet when its submunitions are released. It's not only the spread of the main bomb that can cause injury in a wide area, the submunitions themselves on explosion can cover a great distance. The blast from one bomblet can cause fatal shrapnel injuries in a 65-foot radius. They can also cause injuries to anyone within a 328-foot radius. The weapons were first developed and used in World War II. One of the first known operational versions of cluster munitions was the Butterfly Bomb, aka Sprengbomb de Quandig 2KG, developed and used by Germany against several targets in the United Kingdom. During the conflict, Soviet forces also used airdropped cluster munitions against German armor. German forces used SD-1 and SD-2 Butterfly Bombs against artillery on the Kursk salient. The Luftwaffe dropped more than 1,000 SD-2 Butterfly Bombs on the port of Grimsby in England. Since then, at least 15 countries have used them in the years after. These include Ethiopia, France, Israel, Morocco, the Netherlands, Britain, and Russia. One of the most significant uses of the weapon was during the Vietnam War, when the U.S. dropped an estimated 260 million cluster munitions in Laos between 1964 and 1973. Today, the impact of these weapons is still felt, as fewer than 400,000 have been cleared. That's only 0.47% of them. This has contributed to at least 11,000 deaths in the area. More recently, Russian troops have used cluster munitions in populated areas in Ukraine, which has resulted in the deaths of hundreds of civilians. In response, Ukraine has also used them to retake Russian-occupied territory, and the U.S. has been providing the country with these weapons to help with defense efforts. Cluster bombs come in a variety of formats, depending on what they need to be used for. The first we'll look at is an incendiary cluster bomb. These are intended to start fires to clear a particular territory, such as a forested area or destroy equipment. The damage is caused by the effect of these disasters, rather than the bombing itself. Extensive usage can create firestorms and conflagrations. Some variants contain and deliver submunitions or bomblets based on thermobaric weapons technology. Then there are anti-personnel cluster munitions. These are based on explosive fragmentation to destroy troops or unarmored inanimate objects. Some designs take into consideration both incendiary and anti-personnel purposes for maximum impact. For those reinforced targets, there are anti-tank and anti-armor cluster weapons. This will typically have either a shaped charge warhead or explosive formed projectile to pierce through tanks and other armored combat vehicles. Some designs have guided bomblets for precision targeting, while others produce shaped charged and fragmentation effects to simplify the tactical use of bombs and increase battlefield damage. A cluster munition can also be used to lay mines. The main bomb contains either or a mix of anti-tank and anti-personnel mines as submunitions. These don't detonate on hitting the ground but act like conventional landmines. It's essentially a faster way of spreading mines than traditional methods. Both the U.S. and Soviet Union used cluster methods to deploy and deliver chemical or biological weapons toward their targets in the 50s and 60s. These submunitions contain smaller chemical-releasing devices that release microbiological agents. Then there is also an anti-electrical cluster munition. This has a primary shell that functions as a container and dispenser of smaller bombs that can generate small explosive electrical charges to disrupt or damage electric power transmission systems or jam electronic communication systems. 
All of these systems offer relatively unpredictable devastation across a wide area. What do you think about cluster bombs? An effective weapon or an unethical death trap? Let us know in the comments and please like this video if you've enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. The U.S. Air Force is responsible for the most powerful non-nuclear bombs on Earth. Known as the GBU-57B Massive Ordnance Penetrator Bunker Buster, or MOP, it's a huge 30,000-pound class weapon that's deployed to penetrate the toughest of defenses. Let's take a closer look at just how it works. The MOP is the most powerful and deeply burrowing non-nuclear bunker buster bomb on the planet and is massively important for destroying highly fortified targets buried under mountains, like those found in Iran, Russia, China, and North Korea. The U.S. developed these huge bombs in the 2000s as concerns grew over Iran hardening its nuclear sites by building them underground. Currently, the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber is the only thing able to deliver the MOP operationally although B-52 bombers have been able to drop them during testing. The Air Force's future B-21 Raider stealth bomber is expected to be able to carry one of these weapons, while the B-2 has the ability to carry two. The standard massive ordnance penetrator is 20 feet long and is designed to blast targets more deeply on impact than any other existing weapon. Following this, it then detonates its 3-ton explosives payload, this includes around 4,590 pounds of AFX 757 and about 752 pounds of PBXN 114 for a total of around 5,342 pounds of high explosive filler. What's interesting about these numbers is that the MOP is only 20% explosive by weight. The vast majority of its massive weight comes from its super hardened, dense structure that is capable of burrowing deeper into fortified structures than any other bomb. An explosion from this huge airdrop munition is thought to penetrate as deeply as 200 feet through reinforced concrete that is able to withstand pressure of 5,000 pounds per square inch. The bomb can burrow more than 26 feet into the ground through this concrete before fully detonating. It does this by using the gravitational force of its initial drop and following a laser-guided sight. Once released from the bomber carrying it, the MOP is guided to its target by GPS nav and a pair of stubby fins. The need for such a bomb seems greater than ever before as Iran appears to be proceeding with a nuclear project deep underground. According to satellite images, evacuation mounds at the latest Iranian site suggest a facility could be between 260 feet to 328 feet under the ground, according to the experts. If this is the case, then there may have to be some modifications made to this bomb to get it to be as effective as it needs to be to take out facilities such as these. What do you think about the massive ordnance penetrator bomb? Let us know in the comments and please like this video if you've enjoyed it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then subscribe to Spotlight for more. Thanks for watching.